Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. Today we are going to be continuing um, a little more of our discussion on um, logic. Uh, we looked last time at what it was not, you know, what it was, where it came from with Descartes, a little bit about its function and how it works and, and what it can offer to us, how we can use um, logic not just in our day-to-day -day lives but also in some of the the bigger, more difficult discussions that we're going to have, just say, on a social stage or on a political stage or um, whatever it may be, trying to understand the structure of logic and understand how it works, trying to understand, looking for premises that are true, looking for premises that are connected. You can't have those kinds of non sequiturs, meaning it, it doesn't connect, it doesn't join. Uh, and so looking at some of that more technical side of things, hopefully getting an idea of what logic can uh, do for us and how it can assist us. Today what I want to look at is two things. I want to quickly talk about the importance of uh, defining terms, because we've talked about with Socrates how he would find, um, he, would, he would question those uh, supposedly wise men and he would find uh, inconsistencies in their logic, but then he would also find difficulties with what they were saying at the level of definition. And so if you're having a discussion on justice, um, you have to first define what justice is. Because if you have one definition and the person you're talking to has another definition, you guys are not communicating effectively about the true nature of justice. So you've got to settle in on a definition before you can have those kinds of conversations. So it is important to um, define your terms. And I'm going to give you kind of a simple example, a kind of an older example, uh, meaning that I'm going to be talking about an older understanding of a word versus a newer understanding of a word. If you're familiar with the term etymology, uh, that just is how a, a word come, it means one thing at one time, and then eventually over time and through certain steps of progress, it comes to mean something else. One of my favorite examples of an etymo etymological change uh, is the word um, uh, silly. And so I'm studying some uh, language and I was reading an ancient poem and here's this line that says, you know, bless you Mary, talking about the mother of Jesus in this case, uh, bless you Mary, silliest of all women. Right? Now you read that and you know that they're talking about the Virgin Mary and somehow you don't think of Mary as being particularly silly, right? And so here we are, here's this word, it's strange to think of Mary being the silliest of women, but if you do an etymological search on this, you come to understand that silly used to mean blessed. And over time, it came to mean something very, very differently. And so if you were talking to someone uh, in the ancient world, and you said that, you know, this person over here was particularly silly, uh, they're going to think something very differently than what you're trying to say. And so you have to be on the same page. You've got to be using the same terms. The same thing was true of the word gentleman. Um, the term gentleman used to mean, used to be only used to refer to people who had land and a title. And so eventually over time, as the workforce or the peasants um, start moving into the cities because they can get jobs in, say, factories and they can make more money um, and they don't have to work out and, you know, trying to bring in a potato crop and then giving huge amounts of that potato crop to the landowner so that they're perpetually in a state of poverty, owning only a few potatoes. Um, the peasants start moving off of those farms, the feudal farm, and those lords who used to have that constant income, uh, an easier income, they're losing their cheap labor force. And so eventually they have to go into the court system and they have to literally court the king. Like we talk about two people are courting, dating, and we don't usually say courting anymore, but that's what it meant. These nobles had to go into the court where the king was, the man who had the money, and they had to court him, much like a man might court a woman, trying to convince her to you know, do you know, whatever, to marry him and in this case for the king, to give the Lord money so that his farm could continue to produce potatoes. And so um, what happens is that eventually a book was written trying to help these landed gentlemen, these people who had land and titles, because they never had to worry 
about their own personal hygiene before and they never had to have proper manners before. And so there was a book that was written to try to help them to understand how to gain the favor of the king so he would give them money so that they could maintain their land and their title. Um, and in the book, you know, you were given all kinds of uh, different instructions about bathing. You know, do it more than once every six months. You know, take a bath on a weekly basis. Um, you should comb your hair and cut it. You should trim your nails. You should learn to dance. You should dance well. Um, you should learn to tell a joke and make it look effortless. You know, you should at the dinner table not, you know, not belch. Uh, you know, these types of different things that would make you appear favorable at court. Uh, and so opening doors for ladies, helping a woman with her chair, and, and that's not sexist at that time because the ladies' are, skirts are going to be so big that pulling up a chair, and the chairs are going to be really heavy too, trying to pull up a chair in a dress of that size and awkwardness is going to be tough, and so helping out her out with a chair when she's trying to sit down is going to be very, very polite. The king is going to see that. He's going to smile on you and hopefully give you money, right? And so this idea of opening doors for women, you know, same thing, big, heavy oak doors from back in the feudal days and also a huge skirt that she might not even be able to reach the door because her skirt is just so big, uh, you know, trying to do these things. And that's how it, it developed. And so if you lived in that feudal time period, and you saw someone just being polite, opening the door for a woman, and you said, oh, he's such a gentleman, people would look at you and think, you know, what's he talking about? That person doesn't have land or a title. You know, they're not, they're not Duke so-and-so, and they've got all this land over here that they grow potatoes on. Uh, why does he call him a gentleman? And so eventually the term evolved and became what we have today. Now, that happens over large amounts of time, but words uh, certainly have different meaning, different meanings to different people. And so in our day and in our time, when someone uses a term, uh, if another person has another definition of that term, these individuals are not going to be communicating well. They're not going to be talking about the same thing because they're using two words in two different ways. So. If you were to talk to my grandfather uh, and you were to use the word art, um, he might have a different definition than you do. He's certainly not going to think of some of the more abstract um, you know, paintings or sling art or whatever you might. Uh, some, some people today might call art, call modern art. My grandfather's not going to understand that as art. He's going to think of that as being something else, but it's not going to be art. Um, and that's true not just across like a generational time period or from one person's perspective to another, but it's also somewhat cross-cultural. So for example, uh, let's say that we bring into a museum um, a mask from the Aborigines in Australia. Uh, the mask is a, a mask that the, uh, the witch doctor there might wear as they're trying to invoke rain. They want rain. And so he dons you know, the rain dancing mask and he dances around. You know, Some American walks in there and sees that mask and says, oh, that's tremendous art. That's great beauty. I want that. Buys the mask and you know, he brings it back. To America puts it on display as art. Was it art to the Aborigine? No, no, it was a tool. It was a tool. It would be like taking, you know, a hoe, uh, buying a hoe from a farmer, and then putting it on display, you know, somewhere else as art. And you know, I mean, we we collect old tools. My family has a collection of old tools, and so in a way, it, it's art because sometimes they hang those tools on the wall. They have old saws, like the old hand saws that decorate some of the, the rooms of our house. And is it art? It depends. It depends on whose perspective you're coming from. An ancient lumberjack or an, an older lumberjack in the 1800s wouldn't have thought of it as art. He would have just thought of it as a tool. And so it really kind of depends on your perspective. Kind of back to my grandfather. He owned over a hundred tractors. I don't think more than three of them ran, but he collected old tractors because he really had a, an interest. I don't know if I would say he thought they were beautiful, but he collected old tractors because there was something in those that just made him say, and I want these 
tractors. You know, are they art or are they tools? Well, they're both. Stamp collectors, same thing. Is it art or is it some way to get you know, this package from point A to point B, a, a type of tool? Depends on the perspective. So if you're trying to have that kind of conversation about what art is or what art is not, you have to have some type of definition that's working that allows that somehow we're talking about the same things. Now, gentleman's pretty easy, art's pretty easy, not a lot of controversy there. So jump to a term that's a little more controversial, something like human rights. Start talking about human rights. Now, we're talking about something more controversial. So just what do we mean? Just when does something qualify as human and therefore having human rights? So abortion is kind of the obvious place that we go first. What constitutes that this particular chemical process, and I don't mean to be crass, okay, but all I'm saying here is, is that it, it is a chemical process. At what point does that chemistry become what we call human, and therefore it has the rights of a human? And there are lots of different opinions at which point the chemical process develops human rights. Now, for some people, it's at inception. What that means is as soon as the sperm meets the egg, that chemical process, I, I know it's kind of crude, and I, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but I have to kind of talk about it in some type of terms that are somewhat neutral. And so in this case, that chemistry has rights immediately. As soon as sperm meets egg, it's human, and therefore it has human rights. For other people, it's not at the moment of inception. Maybe it's six weeks down the road. Maybe it's eight weeks down the road. 10, 12, 16, 18, 24. Those are some of the more popular options. And then also for some individuals, three months. For some individuals, that chemical process has no rights until it draws first breath. Until it draws first breath, the chemistry is not considered to be human. And so as we're having this massive... Uh, abortion debate uh, in our culture today, the question is, at what moment does that chemical process become human so that it has human rights? Nobody's arguing about the chemistry of the process. Everybody knows where babies come from. Here's where it starts, and if we let this chemistry work itself out, here's where it's going to end up. We know. We know how humans develop in the womb. Nobody's arguing about that. The argument is, what's the moment in time that the chemistry process ceases to be simply a chemical process and becomes a human being and therefore has the rights of a human being? We don't look at a chemical process, say for example, of uh, the, the blending of Coca-Cola uh, and somehow that chemical process you know, comes together and over time you know, this is put in, this is put in, we swirl it here, and we dump it in the can, and now we've got a can of Coke. It's, in a sense, the same thing. Yeah. In the sense of that it's just a chemical process to people, to, to certain individuals, until it reaches this point. Now, what's the magic moment? And, and, and let, me, let me put it to you this way, too. What's the magic moment for you? Is it at inception? Is it the moment sperm meet it, meets egg? Um, and then what, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16, 18, 24, the moment it draws breath. What's the magic moment for you of this process becomes human and therefore has all the rights of humans? And then, then logically, again, try to look at this and say, are there any exceptions? Would you make any kind of exception for, say, rape or incest or the life of the mother if the life of the mother is in danger? Uh, you know, does abortion qualify? Uh, if the answer is yes to any of those, think logically as to why I think this is a good idea. If the answer is no to all of those or any of those, or any kind of mixture, then wh why? Why is the answer no? Logically, why would we make an exception to for rape? Or logically, why would we not make an exception for rape? And again, the same thing with incest, the same thing with uh, the life of the mother, the same thing if we know that the child is going to have serious birth defects, if we know that they're um, going to be born with, you know, large portions of their skin missing. Uh, that, that's going to be a child that's going to struggle. Um, 
should we make an exception in that case and say yes to abortion, or should we you know, still say no to abortion? Um, there, there's so many different questions and parameters, and the real issue here really is, you know, at what point does the chemical process become human? What's the magic moment? And if you say it's 12 weeks, and, you know, 12 weeks, well, can you abort the child on, you know, day six of week 11? It's one more day. Is that one day? And is there really that magic moment? Think of Cinderella and the pumpkins, you know, and the mice, you know, all that. Is there really that stroke of midnight moment when, you know, this happens? And why is it that specifically for you? Um, and so also then, again, thinking through those, uh, the different options of why you might say, hmm, you know, there are exceptions, okay? You know, let's, let's just say week 12, because I started there, so let's say week 12. Let's say week 12 is the magic moment, uh, but we get past week 12 and we discover that the kid has some type of massive birth defect, uh, and so somehow, you know, that, if that individual is allowed to fully develop, they're going to have a difficult and perhaps even very, very painful life. Are there any circumstances under which week 12 can be violated? Um, that kind of thinking. But once you start trying to understand the terms of what exactly do we mean by human rights, when it comes to the topic of abortion, you begin to see very, very quickly that the first thing you have to understand is at what moment does the chemistry become human? Because at the moment that it becomes human, then it has human rights. And so then you have to figure out why is it that moment, right? And so that's why we have to define our terms carefully. We also have to consider all of the ramifications, meaning that if we decide this over here, then for us it means dot, dot, dot over here, right? So for example, too, moving from human rights now to animal rights, um, just what do we mean by animal rights? And should they have the same rights as all humans have? And now you have to think about your reasons for saying yes or no, and you have to think about them in logical, rational means. And so if you say, you know, an animal has rights, well, do they have precisely the same rights? Do they have different rights? If they have different rights, why different rights? If they have exactly the same rights, how can we enforce exactly the same rights, even if we don't understand for sure that animals, you know, behave and think and have everything quite like we do? And perhaps, perhaps, we're also even forcing on to animals rights that they can't think about, but perhaps even rights that they don't want, which is something that's not talked about often, at least it's not something I've really heard much about. Maybe the animals are perfectly happy living the way they're living, you know, with the relationships they have with us, and they don't want those rights to change. In a way, you know, maybe humans would want those kinds of rights. We, we want to be allowed these rights, but are we forcing on to animals something they actually don't want? That's something that, uh, like I say, hasn't been talked about much. But what exactly do we mean by an animal rights? And, and in this case, should it spill over from animals uh, and move even into nature? Because there's a river in India right now uh, that's been given rights. And there's a panel of humans that have been set up to, uh, to look at the things that are being done to this river to see if somehow the river's rights are being violated. And so w where does it go? Um, you know, how do we understand what rights an animal or a river or humans and all this should have? We have to start by defining our terms. Now, if you're going to define human rights, you have to start by defining what? Well, what does it mean to be human? If you want to start, try to define animal rights, where do you have to start? Well, what does it mean to be an animal? And so defining your terms is going to be very, very important if we're going to have any kind of conversation whatsoever. And so we want to be sure that we get those definitions down before we move forward because there's plenty of misunderstandings that are taking place uh, because people have different definitions of human rights, animal rights, uh, those kinds of things. Okay. Now, defining our terms, uh, that's important. We need to be sure that we're doing that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to jump forward to, uh, jump into today, was um, logical fallacies. Now, when we start talking about logical fallacies, um, what we're talking about is ways of thinking that have um, that have been shown over time, that have been uh, demonstrated to be wrong ways of 
thinking. I'm sorry, I'm, I've got a wireless mouse and I'm trying to bring it back on line here. Because it's easier for me to function with it than it is just this little scrolly thing here. Okay, and so what we've got, uh, this, this is kind of going back into that logic, um, the logical system that we were talking about last time, how we need to have, um, uh, we need to be able to think logically. It's going to help us to function in society. It's going to be able to help us function in our own personal lives as well. And so these fallacies um, are ways of thinking that philosophers have discovered that are always false, they're always false in their basic format. And so they make some kind of mistake. And what you can do is you can start trying to look at and start trying to find different arguments that make these kinds of basic mistakes. Because if you make this kind of mistake, it's always a mistake. And you kind of see how this plays out as we move forward in these what are called um, uh, logical fall fallacies. <clears throat> okay, the first one I wanted to talk about, these are in the notes, by the way. I'm going to go through them and kind of talk a little bit about some of the examples. But if you want to go back and read through the notes that I've included uh, there on Blackboard, it might be helpful as well if you're confused or if you lose track of one or something like that. All right. The first logical fallacy is called the false dilemma. Uh, and in a false dilemma, what happens is that you're being told you can either do dot, 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 or you can do dot, dot, dot. Now, the reason it's called a false dilemma is because it's saying you've only got two options, right? Now, it's a false dilemma if you have more than two options. So for example, if I'm, um, if I'm talking to a child and I say, you can have, you know, there are only two things that you can have for dinner. You can have pizza or you can have a hamburger and there's fish sticks sitting right over here um, that are you know, cooked and fine, there's nothing wrong with them, then that would be a false dilemma because I've told them that there's only two options and in fact, there are more than two options. In this case, there's three and so it's called that false dilemma. Uh, a lot of times, and I'm going to mention politicians in here because these are some of those tactics that are sometimes used by politicians. Sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't, but what can help you as you're listening to a politician or you're listening to really anybody, it doesn't have to be just a politician, anybody who's trying to um, persuade, uh, you, can, you can hear this in commercials, uh, a lot. And so with a false dilemma, I, I can't remember which car company it was, but they talk about, you know, you can, you can have this or you can have that. You, know, you can roll with this or you can roll with that. And it's like, there are other options, right? That's a false dilemma. So you can hear it in commercials as well. Uh, and it, it can actually make listening to commercials, um, I won't say enjoyable because I always change the channel. I hate commercials. But it at least makes them funny. And sometimes as a commercial comes on, uh, my wife and I, you know, we're watching, we're, we both love sports, you know, if we're watching a sports uh, event and a commercial comes on and they say something, it's really, really easy to criticize them and to hear immediately, once you get the, this kind of thinking in your head, to hear how they're using these types of things and that it's, it's just not true. It's, um, it's bad thinking. It may be good advertising, but it's bad thinking. And so a false dilemma just is that idea of, uh, you have to do A or B, and oftentimes, you know, if there's a C and a D and an E available, that's a false dilemma. Um, and it's sometimes, if you've heard that phrase, being impaled on the horns of a false dilemma, the idea is that, imagine that there's a charging bull. The bull has two horns. You have a choice. You can be impaled by horn A or horn B. It's your choice. Now, either way, you're going to get impaled by a horn, but hey, you get to choose the horn, right? Well, that's a false dilemma because there are other options when it comes to charging bulls. Um, you know, you could dive under it and get run over by its hooves. That's another option. Uh, or you could crawl over the fence and maybe escape the horns and the hooves. You know, so if there's options, it's a false dilemma. Now, sometimes a dilemma is truly not a false dilemma. Um, there are things that aren't false. It's really either this or that. So for example, if I'm convinced that there's milk in, in this refrigerator you know, that I'm holding in my hand, and that my wife is, con uh, is uh, convinced that there's not milk in the refrigerator that I'm holding in my hand, we can't be both be right in that sense of it's not a false dilemma. There's no third option. Either there's milk in there or there's not. I mean, there's, there's no other way. Well, well you know, there's kind of milk on Thursday, but... You know, 
either there is or there isn't. That's not a false dilemma. That's, that's a true proper dilemma. And so a false one is just one where there's more options than A and B. Okay. Um, the second logical fallacy I wanted to talk about is called an argumentum ad baculum, and that really just uh, translates from Latin, and it just means an argument from the stick. And in this case, what that means is that you're appealing uh, to force, right? And so basically what it's saying is that agree with me or do what I say or, you know, think the way I think, and if you don't, I'm going to whack you with this stick, right? And so it's an appeal to force. Do what I say or the consequences are dot, dot, dot. And so here's an example. An employee says, I don't think that the company should invest its money in this project. And the employer says, be quiet or you're fired. They didn't give some kind of good logical response as to why the money shouldn't be invested in that. Now, there might be a good reason the money shouldn't be invested in that project, but they didn't give that. What they did is they threatened them with violence, uh, losing their job in this case. Um, or a student says, I don't think it's fair that the deadline for our essay is due so soon, and the teacher says, don't argue, argue with me or I'll send you to detention. Well, that's an argument from force. That's a do what I say or I'm going to whack you with a stick. Uh, one of my favorite examples, and I, I thought it was on here, but it's not on these notes, is the, um, the Empire from Star Wars. Uh, one of the ultimate um, arguments to the stick for them is the Death Star. You know, do what we say, bow down to us, or we'll blow up your planet. I mean, that's, that's a classic argument ad baculum. All right, the third one here then is the ad hominem attack. And an ad hominem attack, Latin in Latin just translates an argument against the person. And so uh, we certainly see this a lot with politics. What happens is that you stop focusing on the argument and you focus on the person who's giving the argument. And so you attack that person and you might attack their character, you might attack their actions, you might attack their background, there's all a number of things that you can attack uh, instead of trying to approach the argument and say, this is why you're wrong. Uh, instead, you approach it from a, um, uh, and you're, you know, you're a meanie head or something like that. Therefore, your argument's wrong. Why? Because you're mean. Well, that doesn't quite work. You've attacked the person. You haven't attacked their argument. And so in a logical argument, in a, in a, a an argument that's actually going to get us somewhere, it's going to take us somewhere, it's going to be healthy and useful, you have to deal with what they're saying and not who they are. You have to deal with their argument and not the person themselves. Once you attack the person uh, and you've stopped attacking the argument, you're no longer having a discussion, a meaningful, useful discussion. Now you're just name calling. So for, for an example on the ad hominem attack, you can't believe Jack when he says the proposed policy would help the economy. He doesn't even have a job. Well, in the beginning, your argument was good. You can't believe Jack. You can't you know, believe his policy. You can't accept his policy about the economy because he doesn't have a job. Just because Jack doesn't have a job doesn't mean his economic theory isn't sound. His economic theory may be very, very good. In fact, he may be one of the most qualified and most brilliant economists that humanity's ever seen. He just might be between jobs at the moment. That doesn't mean his ideas are bad. It just means he doesn't have a job. He might also be independently wealthy and not need or want a job because his economic ideas are so good that they made him so much money that he doesn't need a job. And so you can't attack that person. See, he's such a slacker, he doesn't even have a job. You know, he's a multi-billionaire, doesn't need a job, doesn't want a job, and his economic ideas are good and sound. So you can't attack the person. Another example, candidate Jane's proposal about zoning is ridiculous. She was caught cheating on her taxes in 2003. Okay, she was caught cheating on her taxes. Does that mean that her ideas on zoning are bad? No. No, you've attacked her actions, you've attacked her character, her ideas on zoning might be correct. They might be just exactly what we need to do, but instead of attacking her argument for zoning, or about zoning, you've attacked the person. That's an ad hominem attack. All right, the next one is an argument from ignorance, and this one's a little bit trickier, so just kind of have to uh, stick with me. I think it'll become clear once we get into the examples as well. The word ignorance, just by the way, comes from a Greek word, gnosko. Gnosko just means knowledge. Uh, I think we talked about that in a previous lecture. And then when you put the I on the front of it, it means you don't have any. So if you're ignorant about something, it means you don't have knowledge. It's not an insult. 
to say that someone is ignorant of something uh, is not an insult to them, it just means they don't have knowledge. To say someone is stupid, that's an insult, that's a different thing, because you're saying they do have knowledge and they didn't act on it, that's stupidity. So ignorance in this case might just mean that you, you don't have knowledge. And so for example, you know, um, you, you don't know what kind of shoes I'm wearing. You're ignorant of the shoes I'm wearing. Well, that, that's not an insult, it just means that you don't have knowledge in this particular case. So an argument from ignorance uh, in this case is the definition is something that has not been proven true uh, is decided, believe that it must be false. And also since something has not been proven false, then someone decides that it must be true. Just because you can't prove that it's true doesn't mean it's false. Just because you can't prove that it's false doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that you can't prove it. And so let me give you an example, and that'll kind of help, I think, some of this technical speak here. If there really were a large and unusual type of animal in Loch Ness, then we would have undeniable evidence of it by now. We don't have undeniable evidence of a large, unfamiliar animal in Loch Ness, therefore no such animal, uh, animal exists, right? Now, what that means is that you know, Nessie must not exist, the Loch Ness Monster must not exist because we don't have evidence that proves that Nessie you know, does exist. The non-existence of evidence for Nessie's, uh, for Nessie's presence there in Loch Ness is taken for evidence of that and therefore no such animal will exist. That's an argument from ignorance. We don't know, therefore it must not exist. We don't have evidence, therefore no such creature is there. We don't know is an argument from ignorance. Literally that we have no knowledge. We have no knowledge of the existence, therefore that creature must not exist. That's an argument from ignorance. It's not a good argument. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, there are other ones that you can use in, in that way as well. Uh, again, politicians love that particular type of tactic. They can infer something and say, well, I mean, you can't prove that it's not true, uh, and therefore it, you know, it must be true. Often it reminds me of um, uh, Pinocchio in the Shrek series, if you're familiar, you know, well, I definitely don't not know where he is, that kind of thing. I mean, you can start getting kind of lost in the logic of of uh, an argument from ignorance. But just because you can't prove something's true doesn't mean that it isn't true. It might still be true, you just can't prove it. Just because you can't disprove something's true doesn't mean you know, that it, it's not true, or that it, um, yeah, that it's not, see, I lost myself there, I got Pinocchio'd. Um, whichever way, the opposite of whichever way I spoke first, you know, yeah, that one. Uh, and so, an argument from ignorance. You don't have to, uh, just because you can't prove something's true doesn't mean it's false, just because you can't prove something's false doesn't mean it's true. There, I, I, maybe I and Pinocchio myself and you there as well. Okay, all right. Um, another fallacy here is an appeal to pity, and this one's pretty, you know, pretty obvious just in the name of what it is. But an appeal to pity is when an appeal to compassion is given as a reason for accepting the position that's presented, right? And so, you know, I, I get this in my classes from time to time. Don't do this to me. Um, the student might say something like this, if I don't get an A in this class, I will lose my scholarship. I'm broken without my scholarship. My hope of completing college is ruined. That's an appeal to pity. Oh, you know, pity me. Uh, if, I don't, if I don't get an A in here, I lose my scholarship, right? Well, that's, that's an appeal to uh, someone who's in a desperate situation. And it doesn't mean that someone should have pity on you and should, in fact, give you an A if you've done no work throughout the semester. In fact, you won't receive an A. You'll just lose your scholarship and that's going to be that, right? So an appeal to pity in that case uh, is a fallacy. Another example, uh, you must have graded my exam incorrectly. I studied very hard for weeks specifically because I knew my career depended on getting a good grade. If you fail me, uh, if you give me a failing grade, I'm ruined. Uh, that last part there is an appeal to pity. Uh, I'll be ruined, right? Have pity on me, I'll be ruined if you don't. Um, so any type of example like that uh, is an appeal to pity, and it's a fallacious way of thinking. You need to come up with a better, more logical reason for, and you should give me an A, or I should pass this class, or whatever it might be. Uh, the next um, uh, fallacy, the next logical fallacy, is called an appeal to authority. An appeal is made to the testimony of an authority in a matter outside of that authority's realm of specialization. Now, let me clarify kind of quickly here. You can appeal to an authority and it is appropriate, it is correct, it's not a fallacy. 
if you're appealing to that authority's area of expertise, it's not a fallacy. If you appeal to an area that is outside of their expertise, then it is a fallacy. And so, for example, um, that famous line, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV, right? If you then go to that actor and ask that actor for advice, for medical advice, they're outside of their realm of expertise. And so you've appealed to an authority, maybe it's a very famous actor, an actor that you know you really genuinely uh, think of as, as a, a, a great actor. Yeah, but they're an actor, they're not a doctor. If you want to go to them and ask them about acting, and certainly about playing a doctor, uh, acting as a doctor, yeah, they're an expert, and you, sh you can appeal to them. That's not a fallacy. But when you start taking the opinion of an individual who's outside of their realm of uh, their expertise, then it's an appeal to an inappropriate authority in this case. Um, uh, we watch lots of um, uh, commercials, and if you see, say, a, a, a sports um, star who is advertising for um, an automotive company, what what do they know about automotives? Now they might know something about automotives. Uh, perhaps if you're talking, say, Jay Leno, he's going to know quite a bit about automobiles. Um, but if you're just you know some sports guy over here, he's a really really famous individual, and so you you know you put him in a you put him in a Cadillac, and he rolls down the down the road and says Cadillacs are the greatest cars on the road. Well, that's an appeal to an inappropriate authority. Why? Well, he's he's not a mechanic. Uh, he's, he's not a car salesman, you know, if, if he doesn't know that much about cars, he can't make that kind of claim. So as soon as you step outside of the realm of that person's speciality, then it's an appeal to an inappropriate authority. Uh, if you want to ask, you know, a physicist about physics, great, they're an appeal to an appropriate authority. Uh, if you uh, then ask them about their political views. Well, then they're like all the rest of us, unless they're a professional politician or unless they're a, you know, a professor of politics or something like that. Then it's an appeal to inappropriate authority. So be sure that your authorities are in that field of specializ specialization, uh, and so that that you're you're getting the right um, the right person giving you the right advice. And so make sure you're asking, you know. The right, you know, doctors about medicine and politicians about politics and you know sports people about sports and make sure that you've got the right authority in this case. Also, something that kind of goes uh, hand in hand here with this. Um, uh, I read it on the internet, so it must be true. I read it in the newspaper, so it must be true. I've actually had that said to me, but in a different format. I, I was in a class. Um, talking about this very thing. And then a few weeks later, I was having a discussion in that classroom with one of my students, and that student said, well, I read it in a book. Uh, as we were having some type of you know, in-depth conversation, she said, well, I read it in a book as if everything written in books is true. We know it's not. But sometimes we kind of lose perspective of you know, the authority. The internet is not an authority. It can be in a newspaper, and unless it comes from an, a proper authority in the newspaper, you know, maybe you should or shouldn't believe it. The newspaper itself is not an authority to on anything but newspapers. Just because you read something in a book doesn't mean it's an appropriate authority. It just means somehow it got printed in a book. There are plenty of things in books that are untrue and that shouldn't be believed. Next fallacy is called hasty generalization. Here, uh, you take a non-typical example that is given in order to make a general point uh, covering all circumstances, right? Now that's a beautiful definition and it's probably not helpful, so let me give you an example. Here's an example of the hasty generalization fallacy. Because of the destruction of the shuttle Columbia, the shuttle fleet should be grounded. The shuttles are unsafe. Now, it would be a hasty generalization to say all shuttles are unsafe because one shuttle is unsafe. Just because one shuttle is unsafe doesn't mean that they're all unsafe. It just means that that one was. And to say, and therefore it's true of all shuttles, is a hasty generalization. Or, person A travels through town X for the first time. He sees ten people. All of them are children. Person A returns to his own town and reports that there are no adult residents in town X. 
that is hasty generalization. Just because, I mean, that person made one trip through that town, saw 10 persons, all 10 were children, it would be a hasty and a very general remark, general meaning kind of taking in the whole town, it's a very general remark to say, and therefore no adults are there because I drove through there and there were 10 kids and there, I didn't see any adults, therefore there's no adults. That's a hasty generalization. It's a fallacy, don't do it. There is also one called argumentum ad populum, and here an argument is based on the fact that the belief is widely held and it appeals to the enthusiasm of the masses. Just because a lot of people think that it's true, that doesn't make it true. That's an argument ad populum, meaning that it appeals to the greater population. If everybody in the world thinks that the earth is flat, that doesn't mean the earth is flat. It doesn't matter how many people believe it. All that means is that lots of people believe it. The shape of the earth is in no way changed because of this great population's belief. And so lots of people can believe lots of things, but that belief doesn't make it true just because more people think it's true than it isn't. Um, and so in this case, scientists in every field and national leaders everywhere gr agree that global warming is real, so we should stop using fossil fuels before we uh, destroy the earth. Now, global warming might be true, it might be real, but it's not really true because national leaders and scientists all around the world have agreed. Just because a great number of the population, the greatest, even the majority of the population, believes something to be true, that doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that the majority of the population believes it. And so we have to be careful not to believe just because lots of other people believe. Uh, there's got to be a better argument. That's a, that's a bad argument. So there are good arguments for believing in global warming. Go study those arguments, but don't make the argument that, well, lots of scientists believe it. Well, lots of scientists believe lots of different things that we now know are, are in fact false. Scientists used to think that bugs were going to be basically simple. Once we got inside, we'd find that they were, there's was just some kind of goo in there and that they wouldn't be very, very uh, complicated. And now as we dissect bugs, we find that they're vastly complicated. Yeah, but lots of scientists didn't think so. Well, lots of scientists can, in fact, be wrong. And so we want to make sure that we're not appealing to the fact of lots of people believe so. That's not a good argument. All right, also uh, begging the question or question begging. This is similar to a circular argument uh, that we talked about last time, kind of there toward the end. Um, and it happens when the conclusion that is to be true is, a pr is assumed in the argument. So when the conclusion to be proved is assumed in the argument, it's circular. Let me give an example that hopefully will help. Uh, if someone says, I think he is unattractive because he's ugly, they're using that adjective ugly to try to also say, and that's why he's unattractive, but that's just a restating of that premise. It's a restating of the premise, and it's not an actual argument. Well, he's ugly. Why is he ugly? Because he's unattractive. He's unattractive. Why is he unattractive? Because he's ugly. Unattractive. Ugly. Unattractive. And it just goes into that kind of circular motion, right? And so there has to be something more than just a restating of the premise. Uh, you've got to have that premise, premise, conclusion in that simplistic, uh, logical fashion. Uh, premise, premise, conclusion. But you can't say premise, 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 premise. That's just a circle. Okay. There's also something called a complex question. This is also typically known as a loaded question. And so if you've ever heard in some type of debate, someone saying, you know, that's a loaded question. Um, in a loaded question, our agreement to the question is presumed rather than persuaded. So your agreement to the conclusion is already assumed in the question itself. And so here's a, an example of a question that would be loaded. Will it take another Category 5 hurricane to make us do something about global warming? They're making the assumption in this case that we already believe that global warming is true, and then they're asking the question, well, since global warming is true, what's it going to take? Another Category 5 hurricane? Yeah, but you haven't proven global warming in this case. All you've done is assume that global warming was correct, and then you'll say it's going to take us another Category 5 in order to do something about it. That's making that kind of assumption. You're assuming that conclusion is true. So you should start by, in a good logical argument, you should start by proving, first of all, in this case, global warming, and now that we know that global warming is true, then 
we need to do something about it before we get another cat five. I mean, that's that's the way a good argument should work. Another one, one of my favorites, I actually used this on a guy one time when I was uh, giving a, 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 a talk, uh, and I knew the man, and I knew his wife, um, and so in this case, I just, you know, I was looking at, uh, looking at him, trying not to say his name. I was looking at him, uh, and so I, I knew it wasn't true of him, but again, it's a loaded question, and so I looked at him and I said, have you stopped beating your wife yet? All right. Now, that's a loaded question. Why is it loaded? Because I've assumed that he beats his wife. And so I said, have you stopped beating your wife yet? It's loaded because he's, if he says, yes, I've stopped beating my wife, that means he at one point did beat his wife, and now he stopped. Or if he says, no, I haven't stopped beating my wife, that means at one point he was beating his wife, and he still is beating his wife, in which case he's a wife beater. And so I've assumed that he beats his wife simply by the way I've arranged my question. Right now with him, I asked him that question, and he went, uh... And his mouth just kind of fell open. It was like, you know, yes or no, you have to say yes or Well, no, that's loaded. The answer isn't yes or no. The answer is something else, you know. Never beat my wife. And so uh, be careful of those kinds of complex questions. Again, certainly politicians will use those as well. Equivocation. Um, equivocation is when an ambiguous word is used to make an argument. The word has, no, uh, has more than one meaning. And so it leads to misunderstanding or doublespeak. Now, this is uh, it's one of my favorites because I've seen this one used a lot. And so to equivocate means to make two words equal, and in this case, the words are not equal. And so let me give you an example, and then I'll, I'll talk about another example as well in a moment. Here's the example of equivocation of words. See if you can figure out which word is being equivocated, which word is being said to be equal uh, when in fact it's not. Hot dogs are better than nothing. Nothing is better than steak, therefore hot dogs are better than steak. I'll read it again. Which word's being equivocated? Being made equal when in fact it's not. Hot dogs are better than nothing. Nothing is better than steak. Therefore, hot dogs are better than steak. All right? Now, if you need to hit pause and think about it for a second, you can. I'm going to keep going as if you, know, you figured it out that quickly. Uh, the word that's being equivocated there is, is uh, nothing. So... Hot dogs are better than nothing. Well, that, that's probably true. You've got to understand I used to cook hot dogs by the hundreds. And so I'm not a big fan of hot dogs just because I smelled them and I went home smelling like them and I had grease all over me. And so I'm not a huge hot dog fan. But if you gave me a hot dog and say, you can be hungrier, you can eat this hot dog, I'm going to eat the hot dog. So I agree, hot dogs are better than nothing. Now, as it turns out, uh, I do love a good steak, and so I, I might make the statement that nothing is, nothing's better than steak. Maybe, maybe that's the best food there is. I think we could certainly have a friendly argument about that, and perhaps even over a nice steak. Uh, but nothing is better than steak. That also might be true, but then when you get into that conclusion, therefore hot dogs are better than steak, you can see that nothing in one case is being used in two very different ways. Hot dogs are better than nothing. It's better to have a hot dog than to be hungry to have nothing. Now, steak is better than, or there's nothing better than steak. It's excluding all other food. And so there's no food that's better than steak. So we're using nothing in this case in two very different ways. And so the conclusion there is, is very, very false. Uh, and so see this one used a lot as well, that kind of equivocation, making two words mean the same thing when in fact they don't mean the same thing. And, uh, at some point, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this later in, in, the, uh, in this lecture series, and, and we'll kind of see what, I'm, what I mean. We'll see an example of somebody using some equivocation. Uh, and you can see how it would be confusing and uh, very, very misleading. Okay. The next one is uh, red herring. Now, a red herring um, is a distracting argument. And just a quick background on red herring. Red herring is a smith. A smith it's a fish. I was trying to say a smelly fish, and it came out smish. And so a red herring is a smelly fish. And so when uh, fox hunting was really, really popular um, in the, say, 17, 1800s, uh, all these, the, the gentry, the wealthy people, they would mount these horses, and you'd have people out there, you know, kind of driving a fox, and there'd be hounds, you know, sniffing out the fox, trying to find the hawk, fo trying to find the fox. Um, 
it was a great sport. It was this great game, trying to find the fox. And so in order to prolong the game sometimes, the, the people who were you know, pushing the dogs or running the dogs, sometimes they would pull a, a, these fish, the red herring, they'd pull it across the fox's trail, and that would distract the, the dogs. They'd take off and they'd follow the smelly fish instead of following the fox. It's just to prolong the sport, just to prolong the game. Uh, and so the dogs were chasing a distraction. They were chasing something that they shouldn't be chasing. This happens a lot in an argument. We'll be arguing about this, and then that will lead us off. We'll, we'll stop chasing the fox, the real argument, the thing we're after, and we'll start chasing instead the fish, right? And so that's that kind of heron, a red herring. That's something you're chasing, not what you're supposed to be chasing in an argument. You're chasing the thing that's a distraction. We have another term for this in our culture, um, at least in the culture I grew up in, which was a deer hunting culture. We talk about um, chasing a rabbit, and it's the same thing. And so if your dogs are trying to run a deer, they're chasing the deer, uh, and if a rabbit crosses the path of the deer, Sometimes the dogs will pick up that rabbit and they'll start chasing the rabbit and they'll stop chasing the deer. Did you want them to chase the deer or the rabbit? You wanted to be chasing the deer. That's, you know, that was our primary target and so they went off target. If you're in an argument and the argument is here and you're, you're chasing this argument and then you go off topic, that's chasing a rabbit or it's a red herring. So, for example, more money should be budgeted for the library. Look at the value books have brought to people's lives for hundreds of years. Sheer reading pleasure and intellectual, uh, intellectual stimulation, helpful advice, information storage, to mention only a few. Now, the argument started out as more money should be budgeted for the library. Money budgeted for the library was the deer. But the conversation started chasing the value of books. Look at the value books bring to people's lives for hundreds of years. The value is sheer reading pleasure, intellectual stimulation, helpful advice, information storage, to mention only a few. The argument wasn't about the value of books. If the argument had started out as books are valuable, look at what they've done for hundreds of years. Now, now we're chasing the value of book arguments, and that's, that's good. But just because books are valuable doesn't mean more money to, should be budgeted for the library. Money budgeted for the library is where we started. We got distracted and started talking about the value of books. So it doesn't even have to be wrong. I think books are highly valuable, but that wasn't the argument. The argument was money budgeted for the library. And so it was a distraction. It was a red herring. Um, the next one here uh, is a straw man. Now, a straw man is when uh, you, you try to make another person's argument look really, really weak. And the ancient Greeks uh, did this, right? I mean, trying try to make a strong argument look weak so that your argument can win. Okay? And, and the, the Greeks did have literally a straw man. And so what they would do is if I was a Greek orator and I wanted to win public opinion, maybe I would you know, take a toga, uh, and I would stuff it with straw like a scarecrow. <clears throat> I would put it on the stage with me, and I would have this, this uh, straw man uh, represent my opponent. So the straw man is standing in for my opponent. And so I could then you know, look at the straw man, and I could you know, argue with the scarecrow. And obviously, they're not arguing back. They're not able to give their opinion. And so what you can do is you can make their arguments look really, really weak and look really, really stupid or oversimplified because you're arguing with a straw man. You're not really arguing with a person who has a good, solid argument, and instead you're arguing with a weak caricature of that argument. It's, this sometimes is also called a paper tiger, right? Now, if I'm going to argue with a tiger, and I've got two options, I can argue with a paper tiger or I can argue with a real tiger which one do you think I'm going to pick? I mean, I'm going to argue with a paper tiger because it's weaker. And that's what we mean when we say it's a caricature, meaning that it's a weak version of that person's argument. And what the Greeks would do is they would stand up there and they would have this brilliant argument, you know, and theirs would look tremendous and their opponents would look weak. And at the end of the 
argument at the end of that session, they would push their scarecrow over to show how weak they were. See how weak their arguments over are? I can push them over, just like I could push over a paper tiger. Well, try pushing over a real tiger, and you know, pretty soon you're going to realize that uh, uh, there's more strength there, perhaps, uh, than you know, it, when you're arguing with a real person. So a couple of quick examples for <clears throat> um, a paper tiger. The Republicans want to break into the Social Security lockbox and spend it all on the military. That's an oversimplified caricature of what the Republicans are trying to argue for when it comes to Social Security uh, and with military spending. It's oversimplified. It's a bad argument. There's more to it. It's more complicated than that. And so now on the flip side, the Democrats will risk your future and the future of your children to preserve their cherished control of Social Security. That is an oversimplified version of the Democrats and what they're trying to get done with Social Security. It's not the argument that, that they're trying to put forward. It's oversimplified uh, and it's a very, very weak version of the arguments that they're putting on the table. And so you know, both sides do this left, right, you know, what do you do? If, if you can't beat your opponent, what do you do? You don't join them. You oversimplify their position and try to make them look silly instead of really trying to come in and get into the nuts and bolts and say, and here's what we should do and why. Here's why what you're saying won't work. And then you properly represent what they're trying to say. When you oversimplify and you make it look silly or you try to do that, uh, it's, it's a straw man. It's a fallacy. It's a bad way of reasoning. It's a bad way of thinking. It's a bad way of trying to beat your opponent. It's a fallacy. Now, if you can see these things, because you know, I, I can see them now as I'm watching political debates, I can see when someone uses these fallacies, or if I'm listening to commercials, I can hear this type of fallacious thinking because I've done it a lot. I've had a lot of practice at it now, and it does take practice. So if you can't do it right away, don't be discouraged. Um, but you know, try to... Um, Try to incorporate some of these things into your way of thinking, you know, especially at hominem attack. If you hear someone attacking another person, attacking the person rather than attacking their position, I mean, that's a good sign that you know that other person's position is really weak because, yeah, you know, they 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 can't attack their opponent's argument. Why not? Because their their argument's weak. Uh, and so, if you can put kind of some of these things into your toolbox, that red herring, hey. You know, we were talking about this, and now you're trying to distract me over here, but, you know, you're trying to distract me because your argument's weak and you don't want me to see that, so you change the subject. Kind of start putting those into your, uh, into your toolbox, and it'll help you um, in your own thinking, obviously, even thinking about yourself. And so what's really, really tough, it's easy to see in commercials. It's easier to see in a politician. What's hard is when you try to look at yourself using these same filters, and wonder, hey, do I ever commit the fallacy of red herring because my argument's weak? That's a harder thing to do. But if you'll do it, what you'll start doing is you'll start developing uh, your own thinking. Your own thinking will be better and better. It'll be stronger and stronger. Uh, if you can kind of put some of these fallacies, these known kinds of ways, these known ways of making mistakes into your toolbox, into your thinking toolbox, so that you can pull themselves out, you know, use them, for the world around you, but certainly uh, use them for yourself as well to help you have better, more solid thinking. That'll help you in this class, but it'll help you in your life as well. All right, I'll see you next time. We're going to be talking about the uh, philosophy of science.